Hello, everyone, and welcome to another message from Fountain Springs Church. My name is Todd, and I'm a pastor at FSC. I'm so glad that you're joining us, but no, you're not just joining me, but our in-person and online platforms as we all worship God together. Today, we're gonna to hear another message from one of our pastors, which, spoiler alert, it could be me. And it's been shortened a bit to be broadcasted here on your screen. If you wanna to listen to the whole message, go to our website at fs.church messages. Again, we are so glad you're joining us. John 16, the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. No, no amens to that? Like, you all doing good? Yeah. In this world, you take this, these are words of Jesus, so treat them like a promise. Treat them like a, a, a guarantee if you want. In this world, you will have trouble. Now, most of us, but take heart and I have overcome the world. You're like, I love that second part. Yeah, I do too. Take heart, take heart. Anyone who says take heart in the midst of where I feel like I don't have much of one now, or I feel like I'm going through tough time, take heart. Someone's overcome this. Fantastic. But I think you and I ought to dwell on the first part. Uh, I, I thought about this because you and I have a tendency to classify people and put people in boxes. I know. So I'm like, no, I do not. Yeah. Okay, your pastor does. So here, let me, sh let me show you what hit my mind as I'm thinking about this, how we have a tendency to say, hey, you're allowed to uh, be difficult in my life. And I made a list if you've ever had a coach. If you're a coach, yay you, but uh, a lot of your athletes are showing up to practice going, well, are we going to have to run today? If we're gonna, or how, how much are we going to have to run? Right. Most good coaches pay attention to the physical fitness of their teams, right? Which means you often have to tell these, these athletes, um, run until I just blow the whistle. I don't know how long this is going to be, right? Many of us grew up playing sports, walking into practice, intimidated, not because we didn't think they were a nice person. Maybe we didn't think they were nice, but we were like, well, wonder what's going to happen. There was a bit of a, of a fear of this is going to be difficult. Yet we kept showing up. Think about how you've allowed people, you've given people permission in your life going, hey, will you make my day today very painful? right? Just bring it up. This was in my mind. A physical therapist. Have you ever been to a physical therapist? I love you. Those of you who are physical therapists, you're amazing torture people. I mean, you are so good at it. No. I, I, in my life, I've torn ligaments. I've torn my calf. I've, oh, I've visited physical therapists. And you show up and you're like, I'm so great. They talk so nice to you the first time. And they say, hey, we're going to help you get full range of motion and get your strength back. This is going to be fantastic. I'm like, oh, you are so, you, this is, this, thank you so much. And then you go through your first session and you're like, you're evil. You're, you're evil, right? If you've ever been through physical therapy, you know what I'm talking about, where they've got to stretch you, push you beyond your comfort level and you allow it. You actually want it because you want the full range of motion. You want the full strength back. So you're like, you, you have permission and physical therapy, you're, you're paying for it. You're like, yes. Teachers, another example, right? A teacher, no kid typically says, can we please have a bunch of tests and papers and all that? No, no. But, but you, you get enough comfortable with it, right? You're like, you know what? I expect this. This is right because the teacher needs to stretch me and make sure that I actually know it. Otherwise, if you don't have a teacher, then you're likely going to not learn all that you should learn, right? Okay. So you know that, right? The list is, is, let's go to the other side. Your cashier. If your cashier gives you problems, you write bad reviews. The, I'm just showing you the difference that there's people in our lives going, you're allowed to create difficult and you better make my life amazing, right? No, you never want your cashier to be like, hey, this is actually my break time. Can you hang out here for about five minutes? I'll be back, right? No, you're like, no, no, no. Or if you go out to eat, right? Your waiter or waitress, there's, you, you, they better bring your, your drink back, your food, right? And all, you, you, you think about, in fact, many of you get, yeah, you talk about reviews. Go read restaurant reviews. Oh, my. What I'm just pointing out is the waiter, the waitress, you're not treating them like, hey, we would like for this dinner that we're paying to be the most difficult dinner that we've ever had in our lives. Would you make this actual, like, you don't even ever have to bring our food, but we want to pay you, right? You don't do that. I'm just showing you examples. The garbage man or the garbage woman, I'm sorry. But when you take your trash out, you're expecting that by the next day, at least, that, it, that it's emptied so you don't have trash accumulating in your house. There are people in your life that you like, make my life easier. And there are people in your life, you're like, I know you've got to make it difficult. My question is the reason we took this lengthy trip is where do you have God? 
Here's a lesson just for us to talk about a little bit. Uh, The presence of difficult does not equal the absence of God. The devil will tell you otherwise. The devil will whisper in your ear over and over, oh, you're going through this? I don't know if God's loving. Oh, you had to face that? Or that was, that was your childhood? Oh, 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 that's what's happening to your marriage? Look at all these happy marriages. Oh, my, God must not really care about you as much. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to go through difficult, so God must not be around you. Is, is this a lie? I get told this lie all the time, that when I face something that seems so massive and so big, and I'm like, oh, my goodness, one of the first thoughts is, I don't deserve this. God, why are you making me go through that? I haven't earned that. I've not been that bad of a person. And you and I begin to wonder, if when we go through the bad stuff, God must be doing something else. So we're going to talk about that. That's the bridge we cross. Then, then we learn how to go through it. Romans 8.28, I think, is a good place to go. And we know that in all things, God works for the good, all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you don't understand what this is saying, it basically says good, good can come from bad. I'm putting my dad hat on. Kids? Okay, you're not kids. I know you know this. Is this not what you would tell many of your friends? You at least would tell your kids, hey, hey, this isn't all bad. There's some good things that come come from it, right? But we don't give ourselves the same advice. We don't let ourselves receive that same information, so it's part of my job to remind all of us, whether you're a kid or not a kid, that you and I have got to wrestle with the fact that we may not like what we're going through. It may be unfair, it may be wrong, it may be caused by the devil himself, but according to God's word, that God can take what's bad and he can do some good from it. And you and I got to recognize that just because we're going through bad or difficult doesn't mean God left us. In fact, this is where God often works some of his greatest miracles. The essence of a miracle requires difficulty. Good can come from bad. Keep reading Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It's, it's a type of statement going, he's a big guy. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. Translation, he who was willing to walk himself into difficult. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give give us all things? This is telling us God is for you. In the midst of your trouble, we're reminded in the word of God that not only can God take something that was bad and the devil intended for evil and he he intended destruction, that God can take something and he can turn it into good, but it also began, we begin to learn that God is actually for us. So whatever you're facing, the devil's going to tell you God hates you or he's away from you, whatever. He wants you to not think about God, dwell on God, or at least to be angry with God. What we learn from the word of God, God's with you, he's for you, and he wants to do something good out of it. So still with the dad hat on here, we need difficult, but we try to avoid it. I'm not going to harp on this too much. Uh, That's usually pastor language for I'm going to harp on this a lot. Uh, I'm concerned about the current state of Christianity or following Jesus. I think many of us would say, yes, life is difficult, but I'm going to do everything I can for it not to be. It's why oftentimes if you and I are trying to find out God's will in life and we want to know what God wants, and often we lock onto what God wants, some of our descriptors are, how do you know that's what God wanted? And our answers are often, well, it just seemed like the, the, the natural road to go down. It was the, the open door. And I'm going to tell you, sometimes the devil opens doors. Some of the most difficult paths that we'll ever take are not because the devil's there. It's because God's training us and maturing us. He's letting us go down those roads. You and I, I think, actually need difficult. It's not just about being physically fit where anyone would say, yep, you need to work out, you need to exercise, you need to eat right, you need to do difficult things. That our souls need difficult. That's why God allows it. But we spend a lot of time trying to avoid it. You know, Jesus didn't just say, you will have trouble Best of luck. 
You know that Jesus said actually over and over and over that his way was actually extremely difficult. Let me show you one example. In a sermon he was preaching, uh, he opens up basically what's called the Beatitudes. And I'll just quickly go through this. This is not a sermon on the Beatitudes, but I don't know if you ever paid attention to the Beatitudes. It's basically, hey, um, if from difficulty comes good, blessed are the poor in spirit. Different theologians lock onto different things of this. But I think what's worth our time right now, if you're poor in anything, most of us would say that's difficult. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Comforted, that sounds fantastic. But in order to get comfort, it appears you have to mourn. And many of us have been through enough difficulty that we know that mourning is a choice that is extremely difficult. To actually face your pain and your grief, we admit that's difficult. Blessed are the meek. Pastor Dave, you're going to describe meek? Yes, I'll help you know what meek is if you don't know what it is. Words used to describe meek are often the word gentle or strength under control. Strength under control. Strength under control. That does not seem like we see a lot of meekness around, do we? Difficult, huh? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If that seems like, okay, I don't fully understand what that means, hunger and thirst for righteousness. It means that righteousness, to, to actually live free from sin. So blessed are those who actually fight the sin in their lives. That blessed are those who say, that's sinful, that's not good, and I'm going to keep from being entangled from sin. Blessed are those who actually do the difficult work of fighting sin rather than just giving into it. You're seeing a trend here. This is how Jesus opened up a sermon. You're like, man. Blessed are the merciful. You love showing mercy? Even when it's personal? I call that difficult. Blessed are the pure in heart. It's extremely difficult to have a pure heart. Uh, Blessed are the peacemakers. You ever had roommates before? You ever been a sibling or a family member or a co-worker? You know, that's difficult. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Not only blessed are those who make right choices, those who fight sin. Blessed are those who are persecuted for following the way of God. Fascinating how Jesus says, let me preach a sermon. Life's going to be really tough, but it has rewards. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That sounds fantastic. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Don't take a nap yet, but that's nap time. He leads me besides quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. So far, this is the fantastic psalm. That's why it's so popular. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you're with me. It's that last part that stands out to me that I think you need to see with Psalm 23. Even though, even though I walk with, when we, you, you remember the, the green pastures and the, and the quiet waters and all oh, that nap time, this sounds awesome, but then all of a sudden the writer acknowledges something that I think you and I are trying to avoid. Even though I walk through the trouble. And I think there is your hint. What do you do with the trouble that Jesus promised? Do you avoid it? No, because that's what our world would say. Avoid it. Numb yourself from it. Don't go through it. Uh, demonize it. Say it's the worst thing. No, I don't deserve this. And many of us are trying to avoid difficulty because all we want to do is live the easy life. We would never say that out loud, but it's what we're trying to do. Note what the writer says, even though I walk through it. If you want your guidance, what should you do? Or if you're not willing to accept it, what should you teach your kids to do is to walk through the trouble what your coach would tell you and be like, all right, let's do it. It's what your physical therapist would say, all right, let's do it. Then what about when the word of God says, in this world, you will have many troubles. And then Psalm 23 says, even though I walk through it, you and I should maybe have a bit more of a mantra going, oh, it's a bad day. Let's walk through this. It's a good day. I want to enjoy that. The bad days, we got to walk through it. How do you walk through it? Here's the how-to part. If you take notes, take notes. Dark valleys require a focus. Your focus is absolutely critical because in your dark valley, during your trouble, there's going to be multiple people trying to grab your focus, and your focus is one of the hardest things ever. Remember the last time you ever felt physical pain? You know what you probably did in the moment? You probably lost focus. You don't realize it in the moment. But all you can think about is either your pain or, or what you're losing in that moment. Your focus just goes all over the place. 
Uh, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. Now, you got to hear this. you got to hear this like you're parenting, okay? This is like every, you know, every evening we sit at the dinner table, and it's, it's a part of our routine. We go around, what was the best part of your day? What was the worst part of your day? If you want to know what our family is like, right, we love Jesus, okay? Yeah, I just got to say that. We love Jesus. But you got to know that most of the kids dwell on, they're, they've got a list of 10 things that didn't go well and was the worst part of their day. And there was one good part, but the, well, you got to also hear what so-and-so said at recess and what so-and-so said at the locker. and what so, yeah, Anyone? Just our family. Cool. Uh, anyways. So sometimes we got to say, like, if anything, kids, can you find, can you find anything about today? Maybe the fact that you're eating food you did not pay for right now, right? <laughs> you got to read this, right? If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, sometimes it's hard to come up with, isn't it? Think about such things. Focus. It's, it's, it's the Bible helping you and I understand. Like, like maybe it's not about avoiding the pain. It's about in the midst of the pain or the problem, the trouble, the difficulty, where you go, you're going, okay, what's my job right now? It's not to fix everything. It's actually, what am I focusing on? I began to study this a long time ago because I learned one thing as a pastor. Uh, every human being goes through difficult things, but we don't all go through difficult the same way. And so what I learned is, like, what, like, what are we missing here? Because what are, we, what are we going? And many of us, when we talk about our problems, you know what we have a tendency to do is we talk about what's going on, and then we immediately jump to what we call the outcome. If only this, only, if only this would happen. And we, when we dwell on the outcome, we either dwell on the pain, but we quickly move to the outcome. Like, if your marriage is falling apart, many of us then spend a long time dwelling on, well, the only thing that then will bring me joy is if it's fixed. We dwell on the outcome. If something's going on with someone in your life that you're just struggling with, and you're like, okay, this is my problem, so if this were just to be resolved, and you dwell on the outcome, and what I've learned is a lot of pain actually begins to build up because your heart and your mind are all about the outcome, and you're waiting on God to produce the outcome, and you're, you're not letting them work on you in the middle. And the reason, the reason Scripture brings up what should you do in the midst of your trouble, pay attention to who you're focusing on and what you're focusing on, because God has always known the devil wants to distract you. And can we admit that trouble is really good at distracting us? So we've got to be really good at not avoiding difficulty, at maintaining focus. There's your lesson. You've got to do some training, my friends. 1 Timothy 4, bring this up. It have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Like, don't buy just, like, the random stuff out there that people are saying. Rather, train yourself to be godly. That sounds like execution, not outcome. Train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. What have you been focusing on? Your problem? I'm not suggesting you avoid or deny or reject your problem. No, no, no. If you ever chat with me one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, David, I'm going through this, I'm going to eventually, I'm just going to tell you what I'm preemptively going to tell you. I'm going to eventually, kindly, because I do love you, I'm going to tell you what I do. I'm as human as you, and I have problems. I have troubles. And when I notice that I've got trouble in my life, I pay attention to what I'm focusing on like I'm training for the Olympics. I never trained for the Olympics. I immediately begin to pay attention to and filter and audit what am I watching, what am I listening to, who am I talking to, what is, what is filling my mind, what is actually filling my body. I actually go into, I am pretending like I'm training for the Olympics, so I am going to pay attention at a heightened level of everything going in and going out. Because I think my soul matters more than a gold medal. So if you're currently going through trouble, do not negate how important your focus is. Pay attention to what you're taking in. I'm not suggesting you can never just listen to some good old country music, even though good's subjective. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm not suggesting that. There's days that I listen to stuff that you're like, are you supposed to be listening to that? 
But I'm telling you, if you sense and feel trouble in your life, one of the first things to deal with, what are you taking in? What are you focusing on? Second, dark valleys need community. Psalm 23, 4, I already read this to you, but I I will fear no evil for you are with me. Notice what the writer says. Like, hey, I'm going through stuff. I'm going through problems. Notice notice where he gets a bit of the hope, but you're with me, God. The community, there's, there's a connection already. It tells you that's why it's so important before your trouble, be connected to God. We don't all get that luxury, but I'm telling you right now, so maybe you consider it. But if you read the rest of the Bible, the, God doesn't just say that you only need him. He actually said at the very beginning that you and I need each other. And many times, most people pay attention to their need for community, like literally on their moving day. I'm not hating on anybody. I'm just telling you. All of a sudden, we need to move, and we're like, I have no community. You and I ought to give great attention to the power of community. I, our four-year-old little Bo, he'll sometimes have a, a bad dream, or it's South Dakota. Uh, things will be blowing in the wind at night. And he hears it out of his window, and he'll come into our bedroom, and he comes into our bedroom wanting some peace. I'm not able to stop the wind outside. Uh, I'm not able to eliminate all of that, but he gets a sense of comfort. Why? Because he comes into mom and dad's bedroom. And I thought about as I'm prepping this sermon, what if the opposite occurred for him? What if he woke up in the middle of the night because it's windy outside and he's scared and he thinks there's a bad guy somewhere and he comes into our bedroom and mom and dad aren't there? And then all of a sudden he runs down the hallway to look for his sister in his sister's room and she's not there either. His fear beginning to amp up significantly, right? I can imagine he would be crying at this moment pretty loudly. He runs downstairs, a four-year-old, going through all the different rooms, can't find anybody, not even the dogs, right? Can you imagine what that would do to that little boy? Realizing in the heightened moment of his fear without anyone around, what does that do to his fear? It begins to skyrocket it at, at levels that are borderline evil levels. I think some of you are doing that right now. You have no community, and you're unaware that the devil right now is working on something in your life to terrify you, and you're going to look around and see no one, and you're going to blame everyone. Do the work now to have people in your life serve in your church or in your community. Great way to meet people. Go up to someone who you don't know and be like, hey, I need community. What's your name? You need people. Last one. You may not like this one, but it's okay. It's not what I'm here for. Uh, Dark valleys. I think your problem needs purpose. This is perhaps what some of us have been crying out to God for. Like, why? 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 Why are you doing this? I mean, isn't this the question that when you have a problem, you go, God, why? Why did you let that happen? And most of us in the midst of our pain are asking God, why me? Why us? Why now? And we're not asking God, would you do something with this? You see the difference? God could actually tell you why. You know what still exists? Your problem. You ever think about that? You'll learn that as a parent when you ask your kid why. And they'll tell you. And you're like, that did nothing for me. That, that, that didn't help the situation. And we as adults don't learn the same lesson. We're going to ask God why. And I'm not suggesting you can't ask God or shouldn't ask God why. Ask him why. But I'm telling you, he doesn't have to give you why. But what he wants you to ask him is, God, I don't know why you're doing this, but would you do something with it? Would you use it? And uh, Joseph is a great example. You can read Joseph, read Genesis. His story is epically horrible. Uh, He is sold uh, into slavery by his family. Um, He is wrongfully accused. He is put into prison. He's lied to by friends. He goes through a mess of stuff. His life, in our terms nowadays, has more trauma than any of us will often ever experience in our lives. And it's all documented in the Bible. It's, It's incredible what he goes through. We find him at the end, if you go to the end of Genesis, with this verse, Genesis 50, 20, and he says this to his family, in essence, who has actually wounded him. And you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. What? We live in a world now that's trying to demonize everyone and everything that's ever happened to us. Yet our example in Scripture is, hey, this was horrible, but God used it. Do you see he's saying, this was horrible, but I found purpose in it because God used it. Our prayers should be, God, help me, but also, God, please use this trouble 
It's not you saying, I love it. I'm so glad you brought it into my life and allowed it. We can be mature enough to say, I don't want this in my life, but God, would you use it? Let me, let me show you some verses that might change its, its meaning. Matthew 5 says, you are the light of the world. Oh. It's what a good pastor wants you to hear before Easter. You're the light of the world. Go, go tell anyone and everyone of Jesus, you're the light of the world. It's great. It's fantastic. It's a very motivating verse. It should be. I'm not making fun of it. I'd like for you to hear it differently. Because you are the light of the world. Those are those charged moments. Maybe you sing your favorite song in church or you hear it on the radio or whatever, and you're like, yeah, I'm the light of the world. Can't wait to be the light of the world. Let, 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 me, let me help. On your worst day at work, you are the light of the world. When your marriage falls apart, you are the light of the world. When you're going through your darkest valley that you've ever experienced and you can't stand being in it, you, whether you want to be or not, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, even when your life, forgive me, even when your life sucks, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds when you don't feel like doing good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven when you're mad at them. Sometimes we need to read the Bible for what it's really saying. You're the light of the world even in the dark valleys. Could we actually be willing to admit, followers of Jesus, that perhaps it's what we do in our dark valleys that everyone is actually watching? I charge you this week with the words that Jesus spoke, John 16, in this world you will have trouble. I will have trouble. Every day you will find a headline that breaks your very heart. Perhaps every six months you'll find something in your own life that has broken your heart. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. God has overcome the world. So let's let that lead us into a celebration, right, of Easter, of Jesus overcome. What does he mean? He dies and comes back to life. He overcomes the world. So, in your highest moments and your darkest valleys, may you never forget that God is with you and he wants to do something in the midst of that. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I, I feel the pain of people right now walking through pain, walking through what dif the word difficult doesn't even describe it. In the name of Jesus, would your spirit protect them from the evil one? Lord, would you encourage would you lead them to still waters, green pastures? But God, if this is their season to go through the dark valley, help them go through it with you. Lord, help us to be the kind of church that acknowledges the mountaintops and the dark valleys. Lord, this week specifically, as we gear up to celebrate what you have done in our lives, we acknowledge the pain that was required to give us our salvation, the difficulty that you went through. We acknowledge it, Lord, and we are grateful for it. We love you so much. Help us be a church specifically this week that acknowledges the good and the bad and your glory. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're so glad you tuned in today. Fountain Springs Church is located in the Black Hills of South Dakota, but our community reaches beyond our neighborhoods and spreads around the whole world. Our website is a great way to give, get involved, and get connected. If you appreciate our ministry and want to be part of our mission to show people who Jesus is, here's what I recommend, join us financially. 
When you do that, you're giving other people the opportunity to hear what you just heard. So here's a way to do that. Visit our website at fs.church slash give. And thank you so much for being with us today. And let's do our best this week to show people who Jesus is.